Michelle Proud's Office of Legislative Counsel, and we're talking about S-54. So what I passed out for you is uh, two documents. You'll have a hard copy of the of Chapter 86 in Title 18, which is for your medical marijuana program, and I just wanted you to have the entirety of the chapter. Do you have this? Because um, the, the last discussion, I was kind of giving you the broad overview and talking about the concepts um, there and kind of, kind of trying to orient you, but, um, and then uh, there was interest in kind of having a side-by-side -side of, of what's in 54 and what's in current law. Um, that would have been uh, 50 pages long, and I don't know necessarily that helpful, because it's not late, and so what I've, what I've done is figure we have a copy of this. I created a side-by-side -side with um, what I tried to think about were kind of a lot of the, the policy issues and the policy differences are things that people tend to key in on. You know, the, the language is different. The, the, the idea behind this, just to, to uh, refresh everybody's memory, is that so in 54, because it sets up a new commercial cannabis regulatory system for licensing um, folks to uh, everything from cultivate to, to sell cannabis, um, sets up this new cannabis control board. The medical program would continue to operate under Department of Public Safety um, until uh, January 1st of 2021. And then that program, and I would anticipate also in future legislation, there would be a proposal to move the positions over as well under the board, but because they're only doing positions and funding for FY20 in this, it isn't in S54. But the idea is that to sh once the board is up and running, um, because they're going to be adopting the medical rules in accordance with this new framework, that the then the programs would shift over as well. So what you have with regard to the statutory provisions that are in here in 54 is it is on that date when the program shift over, it repeals this chapter 86 and these new chapters for that regulate the, the registry and the dispensary kick in. And they are, you know, substantially scaled down from what you have now in chapter 86. And so it just kind of provides the framework for it, but it moves a lot of it and the development of procedures and things like that to the board to be, to, to, to do it kind of hand in hand with how they're doing the commercial market. Because thinking about, and so the reason why, and I, just to address one issue that comes up for folks a lot is, well, why not get the commercial market up and running? Don't do anything with the medical now. And you can do that at some later point in time. But the issue is that if you're not looking at the system as a whole, um, what you're going to wind up with is you're going to wind up with, a com with commercial licensees that are going to be operating under one system and the medical that's operating under a different system. And when it comes to, if you think about the dispensaries or, or the registry or stuff, if, um, if they are under certain types of restrictions that don't exist in the commercial market, um, the Senate had wanted to protect the registry and, the, and they want to keep having medical dispensaries exist in a world where there are commercial sales as well. And so, sure. so they wanted to. I, I appreciate that right. something that we, is the, uh, an open question yep. for this committee yes. is whether it makes sense mm -hmm. to um, have one board and one system for what is in effect a medical marijuana system and versus a tax and regulate, as you have, have, have reminded us before, we have had a medical system for 14 years um, under DPS, and there's um, so that's an open question for us as to whether or not to include um, medical marijuana under the cannabis board. Just, um, so I appreciate what the Senate wants to do and what um, perhaps is coming over what <clears throat> the people across the hall may want to want. But as the 
this committee has made no decision one way or another, and we're not taking it as a fait accompli. Nope, I'm just trying to explain the, the yeah. reasoning for how it's structured um, as to date. So, Jude, I'll just say, so the, the new thing that's on S54 it's under my name right. is not from me. Yeah. Um, I'm working from my own desktop. Okay. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what we have for, okay. for hard copies here. And so I think, does everyone have a hard copy around? The, I'm sorry, one I will get it up. There. Well, no, as long as people um, the statute on that. Um, you go on the side by side or yeah. the side by side. Well, you should have two documents. Those you have a side by side, and then you have a copy online. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if there's not a, enough copies, then you can maybe law whatever. And yeah. do you have the what you need yes. in case you want that? Mm -hmm. What you gave one. us the big one. If you mm -hmm. want all three. Mm -hmm. Um. So and I know you're going to be talking from these two, but some of us may want to look at the actual language. Sure, and I actually I want you to, to let me know what's the best way for you to move through all of this um, because uh, this the, is a great way to okay. start. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. It is. It is. Excellent. So I'm going to bring up actually on um, this is excerpted language from 54. So if I can just start moving through the uh, the the side by side. So the first issue, and we talked a little bit about it um, on uh, the last time I was in here, was about the in the definition section. And if, and you should have an. I don't know why this spacing. This is so tiny on here. Sorry, I don't know. I sent it to the copy room, and I don't know why it printed that way. So, but if you look at the definition section that you have currently, so if, so on your in current law. And you look at section 4472 in the definition section. And so right now, uh, the way we, talk, we were talking about the other day is that so for someone to apply to be on the registry, um, they have to have a debilitating medical condition. And uh, they would go to their health care provider. And that health care provider could if they choose to, but they're not required to, sign a medical verification form attesting to the fact that their patient has one of these medical conditions. There is um, a requirement in the current law that there has to be a bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship, which is basically a relationship of, of at least three months duration. And you'll see the language that's there in the existing law in section 4472. Um, of the bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship. That is not in S54. So there is a requirement that in 54 that the patient have a healthcare provider and the healthcare provider definition is the same in both places. The healthcare provider would have to sign the medical verification form attesting to the fact that the person, and then we talked about this a little bit the last time, the definition in current law is is debilitating medical condition, and it lists what that debil debilitating medical condition means. That's subdivision four in section 4472 under the current law. The definition is the exact same in 54, but they refer to it as a qualifying medical condition. So you would think that will make changes as to what might be um, considered um, in future years. Yep. So, so while while it while the language is the same in terms of what the actual definitions are, you take out the word debilitating, and that changes legislative intent. Now, if that is what we want to do, fine. But rest me, the fact that the existing definitions are the same um, does not um, mean that the future decisions will be the same when you take out the word um, debilitating. That's what the will of the committee is, that's what the will of the committee is. But rest assured, that is a significant change. So what is qualifying defined as? Like, do we, are we defining that here? Do we have it's just the It's just the terminology. If you look in the way that it has for, um, so I, what I have up on the screen is from 54. Mm -hmm. It just, oh, it's just it the term. It's just okay. the term that's used. The definition is identical. Okay. So it just says, Qualifying, you know, a person who has a qualifying medical condition may apply to the registry. Yep. 
and in and in the existing lots as a person who has a debilitating medical condition. So it's just it's just a different term. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the, the two of what I would say the primary differences with regard to the definition section. So next box down. Is it okay just to kind of just yeah, go down the chart? Just, okay. Just so uh, the, in current law, the language is very prescriptive about what information is contained in the application, the medical verification form, and the process for, for confirmation of the information. So if you look at section 4473, on, um, so it's like on pages four and five of your chapter handout, You'll see that it goes through and it specifies in detail, you know, uh, DPS has de developed the medical verification form. The form has to include a cover sheet that includes information, you know, the following information. It has to include a verification, you know, and it goes through in, in, in a lot of detail about what everything's supposed to look like and how they go about all the different steps for that. In contrast, in 54, 54 directs the board um, to establish an application process through rulemaking and directs them to create a medical verification form, an application form, but it doesn't go through and it isn't prescriptive in the same way about how they do that, but they adopt that through the process of rulemaking. So maybe this will not be a question for you, but will be a question for um, house government operations or um, others, we have some. We have a system that has worked. We have forms that have been done. Um, why not go with what there is? Um, so that will be. Um, what's the What's the purpose of reinventing the wheel? So that means that will, um, as you're taking <laughs> John, as you're taking questions. So the next one, I just note that there is a requirement in current law that DPS act on the application within nine, within 30 days. There isn't anything specifically in 54 with regard to that. So the board could sit on the application for months? There's requirements around the, the board being established, the procedure for applications and, and, and all of that. So I think it's contained within how they would do that, but there's not a directive, a statutory directive in there for them to, to do it within 30 months, within 30 days. Um, there's also a requirement uh, that there's a, uh, under current law, that there's a review board for purposes of making recommendations to the General Assembly and hearing appeals for registry denials. And the S-54 sets up a different process for appeals, um, in, uh, which is that the board, so uh, somebody could appeal a decision within 30 days um, to the executive director who then assigns the case to an appellate officer. Um, it sets forth the basis for review of the decision and then beyond that there's a right to appeal the decision of the appellate officer to the Vermont Supreme Court. And so that's something that is standard currently in uh, Title III with regard to a lot of agencies follow that procedure and have that procedure. And so this would be a standard procedure of the board for all of their appeals of their decisions. And Even so it would follow that. Agency. Pardon? Even though they're not an agency? They're going to be an, an independent executive agency. Mm -hmm. So moving on um, to caregivers. So current law uh, provides that uh, a person can apply to be a registered patient's caregiver and they would be able to possess cannabis um, or go to a dispensary on behalf of a patient or to grow cannabis for that patient. Um, under current law, uh, an applicant to be a caregiver has to submit fingerprints um, to DPS and have a <coughs> fingerprint supported criminal uh, background check. And uh, DPS is, is allowed to deny that person a caregiver uh, registration. Um, based on their criminal history record, disqualifying crimes include drug-related offenses, uh, violent felonies, and a conviction for abuse of a vulnerable adult. 
Um, there are not requirements for criminal background checks for caregivers under S-54. No, no background checks, is that it? There's no background no checks. Background nope. Check nope. Nope. Um, nope. Again, it's the, 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 this would exist where anyone can possess um, or purchase, or anybody, I guess anybody can possess now. But um, So if any, I mean, this is where I, I personally begin to get a bit confused. If anyone can, can, can possess, and mm -hmm. we're not going to make any distinction between medical and what's required under medical and the adult use. Why have a medical? I mean, if there's why why have I mean why have two separate why 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 even have a medical system? I mean that's I mean if if, if it's not going to be a separate system and there's I mean I, this this will be it. This is an and, this is an and question um, for the committee in terms of for the committee to discuss what is the um, what's the value of having what's the purpose. So, policy question obviously not for me, but I would just say that there is in in the language that I went over last time I was here um, in fifty four. There's the discussion about what a what advantages there are for patients in terms of possession limits and being able to access a dispensary. And then in 54, there's the specific language about what services and products dispensaries can provide that are not permitted under the commercial system. Okay. So, so reading further, I may get the so uh, still on caregivers, um, under current law, there's a one-to-one -one ratio patient caregiver, except for folks who are on their registry who are under 18 may have, have two caregivers, and that is the same in 54. Um, moving on to fees, there's an a $50 application fee and an annual renewal fee for $50 for uh, patients and for caregivers. Um, in S54, there is the, uh, the ability to collect a fee established, but the board is to come back to the General Assembly next January with a proposal for all the various fees that are contained in 54 because there are a number of them throughout the system with regard to all the various different types of licenses. And so um, they're going to be looking at those and then coming back to the General Assembly for, with a recommendation. Are they coming back to the General Assembly? Are they coming back to um, judiciary? Are they coming back to government operations? No, to the General Assembly. And then uh, currently patient and caregivers are provided with registry identification cards and that stays the same. So we've already talked a little bit around, around possession. Currently, patients can cultivate up to two mature, seven immature cannabis plants, and they can possess up to two ounces that is separate and apart from those plants. Um, the cultivation limits stay the same for patients under 54. The possession limit goes from two to three ounces. And then there's the additional language that I discussed last time whereby the, it addressed the F S54 copies the language that was passed last year in H-511 with regard to what what do you do with the cannabis that's harvested from your plants. Once your plants are mature and you harvest it, you're allowed to keep that cannabis that's cult that, that you harvested and as long as you keep it uh, in, uh, in on the property where the, where the plants were cultivated. And so that mirrors current law with regard to the general public, um, but that was not um, because the medical uh, chapter wasn't amended uh, at all last year in 511, that that wasn't those two weren't true. Up um, under current whether it's under um, what we passed last year in terms of grow and hold, how many ounces? In the in the in what we passed last year mm -hmm. for adult recreational use, how many ounces can someone 
They can have up to one ounce. They can have two mature and four immature plants, but anything they harvest off their plants, they can keep as long as they keep it with their plants, and that does not count to their one ounce, and there's no limit to what you can harvest off your own plants. And in, in the bill that's in S76, in the tax and whatever number it is, in the tax and regulate system mm -hmm. proposal, is the number of ounces that I can possess as an adult, does that change from the one ounce? No. So a question for um, government operations, which has done nothing but around medical marijuana, what's the rationale for going from two to three? That will be a question. Um, why, why there needs to be an, an increase in that. Get the thing about storage. But, yeah. Just out of curiosity, um, the, the marijuana plant itself, is it a one annual plant? Do you know? Um, I, uh, if you're growing outside, probably. <laughs> since we have about like a two month growing period, but if you uh, have an indoor operation, I think you can have a, you know, a two or three harvests a year, but you would want to talk to somebody from ag or the dispensaries about that. Sure. Uh, Shane, Shane, you put your life in your hands yeah, going yes, here. Yes, I recognize it. Uh, and and um, you're going to, Shane, can you spell your name, or actually write it down and give your, because we have, um, yeah. we have stand-ins today. Okay. Uh, Shane Lynn, Champlain Valley Dispensary, uh, Executive Director. Uh, so the cannabis plant, yes, you, you harvest it, plant is dead, basically, you know, it's annual. So it's one time in the fall if you're growing outdoors. If you're indoors, you can have upwards of probably five to six harvest cycles within a year, but there would be different plants that you'd be using. Does that help clarify? Yeah, yeah. So, so the plant itself, if I got one plant, I can harvest it. One once. time. And then you have to start over. With a different seed. Uh, yeah, seed or a club. You can cut it. Yeah, you can cut it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Cool. And I would just, um, when you say like what is like asking government operations what is the reason from going from two to three that's all part of the senate proposal ah. so they haven't uh, oh, okay. they have okay. not done yeah, yeah. All right. so we have taken a very light touch on this section okay okay good good to know but i'd be happy to try to get any answers. oh no you don't I mean, this this clarifies for me who we either need to get information from or the fact that we are not um if you have this is the section that you are asking us yes. for our recommendations. Yes. So it's not like we're saying what you did, House Government Operations, we disagree with. It might be this is what, as you are amending the good work that the Senate did, we suggest that you do this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Clear as that. What? <laughs> Um, so no changes to the non-medical adult use possession or anything like that. Um, the only the change for medical in 54 is going from two to three ounces and adding the, the clarity around what happens when you harvest your plants. Um, next box, uh, just a few little random things. So uh, patients have to designate one particular dispensary that they will use. They're not allowed to go to any or all of them. They have to designate one with EPS. Um, uh, they have to make an appointment in order to go. They can't just go whenever they want. Um, and they have to transport cannabis in a locked container. Um, none of those provisions are in 54. Um, I will also just mention that under 511, um, people who are not patients don't have to transport in a lock container. People that are not patients. What, they're limited to one ounce? 
Yes. Whereas the dispensary could have 30 ounces if they were delivering. They could be making. No, this is for patients. Mm -hmm. Mind like a sieve. Did they take? Uh, did the um, one caregiver per patient? Yes. Did, did that stay in? Or stay. That stay the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so does that mean that um, if they are transporting cannabis under fifty-four, mm -hmm. there's no one. I'm sorry. Or does it just mean they don't have to do it in the long box? They don't have to do it in a locked box. Um, cannabis is now legal. One ounce. So that's what they can have here. And so, um, and, 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 I, and, and with my one ounce, I can drive anywhere around Vermont. Well, you need to have it in your locked glove box or your trunk. Oh. Under current law. Okay. But so no. this, so um, would that, so. That's what that was. That's part of the legalization law. The legalization right, right. law. Well, I, mean, right. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, I get. But you could have it in your back. I could have it in my purse. I could have it. I could have it anywhere I want. But patients, because they're still operating under the medical, and 511 didn't amend the medical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. I can have it in my backpack, but a patient can only have gotcha. it in a locked container. Gotcha. So I just point that out yeah, as. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to. Right. Um, understand that it, maybe it does not make sense even if we were to maintain the separate system that right. it would not make sense to say okay um just say you're a regular person and not a patient and right. you can care or, I mean, right. So, uh, so moving on to the next one. So current law has requirements for a secure database for records of patients and caregivers accessible only by DPS. Uh, they have to maintain a separate electronic database for law enforcement personnel to access 24 hours a day. Um, the, there isn't any provision about that in 54. Um, they do have a provision that individual names and identifying information about patients and caregivers are exempt from, uh, from public records law and copying, um, but there is not the same kind of uh, um, closed system database. But I, I don't know that that necessarily translates to anything different between those two. But there is not something that requires a, uh, a a database for 24/7 access by law enforcement. Um, uh, again, that sort of thing I would say when you're thinking about was created at a time when it was still illegal for everybody. So if you came across, if a law enforcement officer came across someone <coughs> who had, was in possession of some, some cannabis, it was illegal unless you could prove that you were a medical patient. Except um, when we passed uh, the other bill, I can't remember the name, where you could have two plans in full. Right. That's what. I, that's right. So right now, the difference is be, the difference is between a regular person and somebody who's on the on the registry would be that the person who's on the registry can have three additional immature plants, and they can have one additional ounce than I could. Right. So, but but what I'm just saying is that when you're thinking about a lot of these things, they were created in, in a moment when cannabis was illegal for everybody unless you had an exception here. So in terms of law enforcement being able to check a 24-hour database, it would be that somebody says, well, they caught me with some, some cannabis, and I say, but I'm a patient, but I don't have my card on me. They would be checking that. Um, now it's a tick, you know, it's if I was publicly consuming, it would be they would write me a ticket, but it wouldn't be illegal for me to be in possession of that cannabis unless I was over my ounce. So perhaps a question. First of all, um, we'll be asking you to testify. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Just a heads up. But um, if we are treating this, if Kansas is now legal, and if we maintain a separate system, which is called, which is marijuana for symptom relief or medical marijuana, and if we're treating this as a 
uh, way of, of addressing qualifying or debilitating disease. Maybe rather than this special kind of language around um, around names, but isn't there, um, in terms of the medical world, um, privacy protections? And why should this be? I mean, so my question would be, should this be any different? Or would the medical community freak out? Or, I mean, you know, I mean, if we're looking at the reason why these are not um, subject to, you know, that they're private, is because this is a medical, and one's medical things are private. Mm -hmm. Why not use that language instead of, and this may be, maybe this may be the same as medical language, I don't know, but I mean, it's just a No, question. it's not, and there is some specifically with regard to the patient information, but because it's all exempt <clears throat> is the way it is on there, but you can certainly add some language into 54 around, around the HIPAA stuff. The HIPAA, yeah. So also around uh, access to, to data in the registry, so in response to a person-specific or property-specific inquiry by law enforcement, um, uh, DPS can verify the identities of a property address or a patient. So if somebody's concerned about that their neighbor has seven immature plants instead of four immature plants and, and they drop a dime, then DPS can confirm to the law and enforcement officer that calls that, that yes, that person's on their registry, and that's the same in 54. Um, bottom of the page, uh, current law establishes a marijuana for symptom relief oversight committee for making recommendations to the General Assembly. There is no uh, parallel to that in uh, 54 because there is this new board that is directed to be doing that regularly. So next page, um, currently dispensaries are limited in how much cannabis they can possess based on the number of plant, uh, patients who designate that dispensary. Um, and so the formula is for each patient that is designated the dispensary, the uh, dispensary can have two mature, seven immature, and four ounces per patient. And so that's their cap. In 54, there are no <coughs> statutory limitations based on cultivation, it's going to be determined by the board as the board is establishing tiers for the different types of licenses. And so if a, if a dispensary, um, uh, you know, is going to, based on their license, they may be in certain categories based on their cultivation size, but that's gonna be something that the board's gonna be developing by rule. Well, and clearly, if we, if, if we agree the patients do not have to designate right. a um, dispensary. I mean, that was sort of, exactly. Designate, and then, however, you have to designate defines right. how many. Um, if we're taking away the designation, then it doesn't make sense to. To that would need to be figured out by someone other than us. Right. Yep. Um, next one is dispensary under current law is required to have a sliding scale fee system that takes into account patients' ability to pay. And in uh, S54 requires the board to adopt rules regarding. Excuse me, we're going to have to take a little break. We have to, corporations wants us to do something. Sorry. Yeah, that's the only Okay, um, sorry, we're taking a little break. We're now, we're, we're back to lead. <laughs> Fine. So the issue that Ann brought up is the only issue that they have, which is... Um, um, okay, we're back. Um, <laughs> so uh, dispensaries you. are currently required to have a sliding, fee scale, uh, sliding scale fee system okay. that takes into account registered patients' ability to pay, and under 54 requires the board to adopt rules regarding pricing guidelines for the goal of ensuring cannabis and cannabis products are sufficiently affordable to patients and caregivers. But it's different than a sliding scale. Yes. Shane and others, we may want to hear what you think about having some entity tell you what you can charge. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be
they just they just can't let the cheese. <laughs> yeah. <Tree. laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. But hey, you know. Okay. So uh, under current law, uh, requires a biennial audit for dispensaries. Um, there's not such a requirement in the statutory language in 54, but it requires the board to adopt rules regarding record keeping, banking, and financial transactions. For this is my is this for just medical mm -hmm. or oh no you have to for the other ones as well yep. So, so so is this language for I mean I'm just trying to is this language for future any kind any store that is distributing yes but it also there's a this is also required for dispensaries okay yep no how how do they do that are they are they going to be able to use the bank now you know it's an audit this is audit in terms of how they how they do things. Oh, it does say banking and financial. Yeah. Well, someone yep. checked it, but maybe it might have jumped right out of that page. Oh, okay. Okay. One's an audit. That is an awesome. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. I managed to sit still for an hour and a half to make that. I'm very proud of myself. Thank, thank you very stuff. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is very important. It is. What? Is it not enough? No, it's okay. Who cleans it up? Sorry. James, it's not here. Okay. Oh, we don't have any language yet. Yeah, okay. I, I, oh, that's no, all right. James. There's some, um, I don't have it in here yet, but Commerce made some recommendations to government operations on the financial okay. transactions and the banking. So that's included okay. in there. Um, so, uh, so that. currently dispensaries are required to label cannabis as follows. They have to identify the particular strain. Um, they have to identify the amount of THC in each single dose of uh, an edible or uh, product. And they have to contain a statement to the effect that the state does not attest to the medicinal value of cannabis. Um, in 54, uh, there's a lot more with regard to, uh, to labeling. Um, there has to be, or there's requirements that cannabis is clearly identifiable with a standard symbol indi indicating that it's cannabis. So the idea that the, the board's going to have adopt a symbol that basically everything, a, a, any product, whether it's being sold through dispensaries or through the retail, is going to contain the, the symbol. Um, they have to label the with the potency of the cannabis um, by the amount of THC and CBD in milligrams total. There has to be an appropriate warnings concerning the potential negative consequences of consuming cannabis and the need to keep the product away from persons under 21 years of age. So that's for cannabis. And then they have separate ones for cannabis products. So for cannabis products, requirement that they have to be using the standard symbol. Um, they have to label with the potency represented by the amount of THC and CBD uh, in milligrams total and per, and per serving. Um, they have to list the length of time on the label that it typically takes for a product to take effect. And the appropriate warnings concerning potential negative consequences of consuming cannabis and the need to keep it away from under 21. So this is um, labeling requirements for adult recreational as well as medical. Yes, because there's medical is available to people under 21. Mm -hmm. So um, there are there is something appropriate. <coughs> I mean, so I'm not quite sure how we fit in that appropriate. I mean, mm -hmm. there may need to be different kinds of warnings or a different type mm -hmm. of things available. If, because under current law, medicinal marijuana is available to youth, youth who have cancer, youth who have um, epilepsy and stuff like that. So, so it's, I, I guess if, if we believe in that, to then have a warning going, we're giving it to your kid because your kid, um, this is really, Charles Webb is really effective for epilepsy, and then have a 
Oopsie, you're not supposed to, warning, not under 21. Yes. Um, we did take testimony uh, about an adult. Uh, And for the record? For the record, uh, Representative John Gann from Wilmington. Uh, we did take testimony about an adult patient giving his medical marijuana to his son and daughter. And his son sold it. That's cool. So just. Mm. Oh, OK. Mm. That may be one reason to warn. Most patients are above the age of 21. It, from the testimony we heard, there's only a small group that are under the age of 21, and Shane can probably provide better testimony. Mm. On that. Well, Shane might be able to, and I. He's a wonderful person, but I would be looking to the state agency that has all the registered patients. Sure, that'd be great. Because <laughs> Shane may be the dispensary magnet with two. <laughs> there are five. But thank you. That's a good. I never thought of that. Oh, God. <laughs> the only ones that serve kids. Oh. <laughs> Um, all right, so next page um, is current, under current law, uh, statutory scheme, there is no requirement for testing cannabis or cannabis products for contaminants and potency for quality assurance and control. Um, that is something that is required under S-54. So the board's adopting rules that will build out um, what those procedures and standards for testing would be. Okay. Are we going to, we the state, are we going to do the testing or are we going to require the, for the dispensaries to test their own? So, um, so that's part of what the board will be developing rules. They were, the way that it's contemplated is that they're, in terms of compliance testing, um, the state would be doing that. And they would probably, the board is to come back to the General Assembly with a build out for year, for the second and third fiscal year with how they're going to have positions or, or, or work with other agencies. I would imagine they're going to be looking to be utilizing the services of the Ag Lab. And there's language um, that government operations is adding um, that would allow the Ag Lab to possess cannabis and cannabis products for the purpose of, of testing those products the way that they currently have the authority to do that with hemp. And so the board would be able to use the Ag Lab for compliance testing, um, the way that like DPS might use the Ag Lab for compliance testing. Um, and so that is so the compliance testing different from the dispensaries kind of testing their own for purposes of determining how they're going to be labeling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, uh, also under 54 um, that is not under current law is that it requires the board to adopt restrictions on the use of pesticides that are injurious to human health and establish standards for both indoor and outdoor cultivation of cannabis including environmental protection requirements. Sounds great. Are there in, for adopting standards? Who is ensuring that the standards are followed? Is that the department? Is that ag? No, it would. Everything will be regulated by the by the cannabis control board. So the can the, the can so the cannabis control board would have people who go and visit or randomly test. Yep, they're going to either be and again, it's the the because at the beginning, it's just the rulemaking and setting everything up, but they are supposed to come back with a proposal for the implementation of how they're going to be doing compliance um, and law enforcement around this. So it may be that they have um, recommend that they are partnering with ag to do with certain plant inspectors that are in the agency of agriculture or maybe they want to look to transfer positions over or maybe they want to create their own positions within the control board but that's one of the things they're supposed to be looking at is, com is coming up with a proposal um, for the for the year two and three build out for inspections. So, is the some of the board at least one of the board members have some background in healthcare, so they would know what kinds of things to recommend when it comes to this sort of 
standard? There's requirements in for the rulemaking that they be uh, that the board be collaborating with other state agencies and interested parties in the rulemaking process where there may be expert some expertise in existing state government. So when you're talking about um, let's say on pesticides, right? They're probably not going to reinvent the wheel. They're going to be working with the agency of agriculture, food, and markets with regard to what you know, looking at well, what pesticides are currently banned? If they're going to be in certain consumable products, what should they what should be allowable? Um, they may be looking at copying rules and applying those and adopting those for cultivators and under the commercial system and for dispensaries. Um, and so they'll be working with other people. There is um, uh, an advisory board that's part of the uh, government operations draft. There's an ad they are required to establish an advisory board. And there are people that would be represented on the advisory board in public health and plant science and various things like that. Um, so next, uh, currently um, there are only five uh, licenses available for dispensaries, that's statutory. Um, Licensees may serve patients at two locations and have a separate location for cultivation. Um, there's no specified number of licenses in 54. That's numbers to be determined by the board. Is this, is the term dispensary as used here solely for the medical? Mm -hmm. um, yes. What is the term for the places where I could be able to go to a store. So uh, those are cannabis established, licensed cannabis establishments okay. as opposed to a licensed dispensary. And then for a licensed cannabis establishment, there's five types of licenses. So there's cultivator, product manufacturer, wholesaler, testing lab, and retailer. So if you're talking about point of service and being able to go and buy a product, it would be a licensed, uh, a licensed cannabis retailer. So, so I would go to a licensed cannabis this retailer to purchase mm -hmm. a cannabis product because I and because I don't have a medical condition. Right. Mm -hmm. and, but if I have a medical condition, the, the name, the establishment that I would be would going be the to dispensary. would be a dispensary. Yep. Will they always be separate, or is there? Will, do you provide in this law the opportunity for a cannabis, a licensed cannabis retailer, and a licensed dispensary to be in the same building? They um, so you could have a dispensary <coughs> owner who then obtains one. They're allowed to get one retail license, and. Um, if they there's language in 54 that specifies that if they're uh, if if they are going to be co-located that the board um, or that the board adopt rules for uh, ensuring patient confidentiality and access to products and some privacy so that there's so that they are actually in the same facility um, that they're that the patient's needs are addressed. And, mm -hmm. So uh, um, moving on, so current law requires every applicant, owner, principal, financier, and employee to submit to fingerprint supported criminal background checks. Um, so if you're going to be an owner or you're going to be associated with a dispensary or you're going to work at a dispensary, you have to get your record check. Um, that's the same uh, under S-54. Current law requires DPS to adopt rules to determine whether a person should be denied um, uh, either a license or participation <coughs> as an employee or uh, on the board of a, of a dispensary because of their criminal history record indicates that the person's association with the dispensary would pose a demonstrable threat to public safety. Um, and the rules should consider whether a person who's been, who has a conviction um, has been re rehabilitated. Uh, the standard in 54 is the board is to adopt rules for determining whether a person should be denied um, a car because their criminal history record uh, based on factors that demonstrate whether the applicant presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the regulated market. 
under the current system, um, uh, folks who have a conviction or a pending charge for a drug-related offense or a violent felony are not able to be either associated in any way with a dispensary. Um, and under 54, nonviolent drug offenses shall not automatically disqualify a candidate. And there are not, there's nothing in, in the statutory language in 54 that says you're automatically out. It requires the board to adopt a rule system on determining how they make this assessment around whether or not the person uh, presently poses a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of a regulated market. And states, if you look at the other states, they all have different ways of doing it. Some do it up on a point system, some, um, so there's a lot of different models out there. But the, that is a big difference in the terms of a lot of things in 54, um, a lot of the stated goals in 54 are to try and move as much of the illegal market into the regulated market. Um, and uh, and then there's been a shift in thinking around the issue of people who might have had previous drug convictions and whether or not that should exclude people from participation in the market. And so that's just something that's kind of evolved and changed over, over the years. And perhaps a, a, a discussion for us is whether the medical market mm -hmm. is, um, creates some, or the medical, people who come in with a debilitating medical condition who can have more product, whether, whether there is a difference in requirements. Well, so this isn't who can purchase. No, 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 it can work. Who can work. Who, who can work, in other words, who can, who can, just like who can give out a prescription mm -hmm. is different than who can sell aspirin. Mm -hmm. There may be, I'm not saying there should be, I'm just saying there may be a difference in terms of vulnerability or amount, you know, or the risk of who is behind the counter. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to the next one, uh, require, current law requires DPS to adopt rules regarding the medium and manner in which a dispensary may notify registered patients of its services. Um, and then, uh, if, um, fairly sure that by rule DPS uh, essentially banned all advertising. Um, under 54, it requires the board to adopt guidelines on advertising, marketing, and signage. Um, but I also put some language in there on the next page um, that's part of the commercial system in 54, but not on the medical, but you might want to consider, is that uh, language that bans advertising that's deceptive, false, misleading, promotes overconsumption, represents that it has curative effects, can't offer a prize, award, or inducement for purchasing cannabis products, um, can't have advertising that depicts a person under 21 years of age consuming, or is designed to be, or has the effect of being particularly appealing to persons under 21 years of age. You can't have uh, certain types of advertisements unless the licensee can show that no more than 30% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21. Um, advertising has to contain warnings and then there's prior, there's a requirement that any advertising that's done has to be approved uh, by the board prior to publication. So those are just some things that are elsewhere in 54 if you wanted to consider those on the medical side. Next is current law requires DPS to provide I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this. Um, presently, there is no advertising. Correct. Yeah. So exactly. under, 50, under 54, mm -hmm. um, there will be some advertising. There could be some advertising, yes. The board's going to adopt the rules around that. Yeah. Yep. There's the, all those things that are listed. There. Those things that are listed there are things that are set up for the commercial system that you may want to import for the medical dispensaries as well. I just wanted to show you, give you some examples of things to consider. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, next, the current law requires DPS to provide educational and safety information developed by Department of Health to each patient and caregiver. Under 54, it requires the board to adopt uh, requirements for the dissemination of educational materials to consumers who purchase cannabis and cannabis products. Um, current law allows dispensaries to deliver, and 54 does as well. Um, currently, there is a Department of Health. Okay. Did anyone know, do, um, Shane, is there um, already educational safety information? Yes, yes. I mean, we do our own, and then I think the health health department puts out a one or two pager that uh, had some go between before here. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it in years past. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Love to see what that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sort of like, why reinvent the wheel if mm -hmm. we have it? Mm -hmm. And finally, so current law provides and um, that nothing in Chapter 86 shall be construed to prevent a municipality from prohibiting the establishment of a, of a dispensary or from regulating the time, place, and manner of a dispensary through zoning or other local ordinances. Um, and there's nothing in 54 under the dispensary law about this, but there's language elsewhere that you could import as, because it's applied just to the commercial establishments. Um, there's a process where municipalities can opt out by putting it on the ballot for a vote. They can issue local control licenses similar to what they do with alcohol, and they can require compliance with local ordinances and bylaws. Is that the same thing? No. Um, I would say the existing law is a little vague. It's not conferring, you know, because we're a Dillon's rule state, uh, this language under existing law is not conferring new powers, but it's saying we're not taking away any powers you might have, but they don't actually have the power to ban, so. so um, 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 I, I, I'm a simple person. Under current law, mm -hmm. if Moscow, Vermont, mm -hmm. take Shane, if you can't do went to Moscow, Vermont. Well, no, I was trying to pick, you know, a thing that wouldn't make sense because there are four people there. Um, <laughs> um, can, 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 the, can the town? Is the question before the town, do nothing, and it's, I mean, it, it, it's the opt-in, opt-out concept that there was the little. So um, is there a difference in that, in these two things? Um, in these two things, I would say that under current law, I would say it's not, there's not really a process put forth or a procedure. I would say that I would, that this just says that 86 doesn't interfere with a municipality's inherent authority, whatever that is, but it doesn't grant them, I would argue, oh, not, oh, not necessarily any new authority under current law. And so under current law, I would say they would need to comply with whatever zoning, you know, requirements or stuff like that. So if your town is not zoned for that type of business or whatever, you know, they also have ability to regulate based on nuisance and, and certain things. And so whatever their inherent authority that they've been given by the legislature, they could use. But they haven't been directly, I would say, you know, necessarily given, you know, a procedure to, to ban. So in so 54, mm -hmm. there is new process where you, towns well, you can, can ban. ban. Yes, towns so can why, ban. Well, why do we want, I mean, under current law, if I decide I want to open you know, there's space and there's only four, whatever, and I decide I want to open a dispensary in Moscow. And my dispensary meets all of the um, zoning requirements. The only limitation that they can put on is, and you can only be open one day a week. 
Moscow, I mean, if I meet, it sounds like under current law, if I meet everything, um, they can't say you can't be there. Right? I mean, is that what it's that what that, no? no? Am I reading it wrong? No, they, uh, from my recollection of reporting this bill, they can pass an ordinance saying, yeah, saying sure. there, shall be, be there. there shall be no marijuana right. business in this town. Right and now. A couple, of, can, a couple okay. of towns have done that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And they can pass an ordinance. How do you pass an ordinance? Uh, select select board. Select board. Okay. And so. It was on notice, but. Yeah. And then there. People come. come. People can petition oh, to have like it removed within a certain period. Okay, so what this does is uh, it says. So the language, I just want to be clear, the language that I have over on the 54 side is not for dispensaries. I just put it there for you to right. consider no. that it mm -hmm. is part of that. And I was yep. trying to figure out what is the, um, so is the language in current law around dispensaries in this bill? No. There's nothing in there so there's around nothing. municipalities. Okay. No. Either way. I'm right. There, I'm there. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Sandy. I think you told us this the other day when you first came in, but mm -hmm. am I correct that, that after the the trial period, you know, where, where the dispensaries go away, that basically we are moving this S S fifty four as passed by the Senate will move everything from Title eighteen to Title seven about everything related to Eventually, that. yes. It, what it does is in the sections that you have is the adoption of the new statutory language framework um, and then chapter 86 will be repealed and then, yep and then and then the new stuff comes in and that's January 1st of 2021 and title 7 is basically agriculture nope title 7 um, is uh, currently alcoholic beverages and tobacco and it's retitled alcoholic beverages tobacco and cannabis Alcoholic beverages, cannabis, tobacco, or something like that. So did, and the health department came in. Finally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so many questions. So that's the walkthrough of just the kind of what I would see mm -hmm. is the framing of the main points. It, uh, you know, there are certainly lots, there's lots in here, lots of language and smaller points and things like that, um, but I didn't know how to take all of this and put it in a chart against the other one. Can I? Your response to Sandy, your response to Sandy was that, um, in 2021, mm -hmm. everything related to um, medical marijuana, the current law goes away and it gets put in something else, whatever section. Mm -hmm. The things that you have outlined here, mm -hmm. are they changing immediately or is this what's going to change in 2021? 21. So let me ask a simple, because I'm a simple girl. A simple question. Um, why put it in here at all right now, and why not um, do it at another time, as opposed to in the last two weeks of the legislative session? I hear you, and I. <laughs> Um, and if I could figure out how to do that and do all the rest of the stuff that has to happen in 54, I would do it. Um, and so, but the issue is that if you think about the, when we talk about all the things of the way that 86 operates now, and nothing is going to change. And you have, right, but you have, but what, but, um, but what will be happening is that once the board get starts in the fall, they're going to start working on adopting rules for the new commercial system, but also for what the medical rules will look like for 21. So there's not, it's not that there's not a, um, 
there's not a, a shifting of the DPS rules over automatically to the board. Why Again, not? Be, I'm sorry? Why not? Um, because of the policy, I mean, you could certainly have a conversation and talk about whether or not um, you would want to do that and leave 86 the way that it is, shift it over to 7, change the terminology, shift the rules over. Um, but in thinking about what you have let's say let's say let's let's use an example for the for like the testing and the labeling and all of that kind of stuff so if they're adopting their the board is going to be as requirements to be adopting all these standards for testing and labeling for these newly licensed cannabis establishments that are um, that are coming online if dispensaries continue to operate under the old ones rather than, then you're gonna have the new commercial ones with testing requirements, labeling requirements, all those kinds of things that you probably want from a consumer protection standpoint, but dispensaries are gonna be operating under the old system where they are not required to do any of that. Mm -hmm. And if so if you wait like another year, let's say, and say tackle that next year, then the board is still going to have to adopt new rules and we know that rulemaking can take considerable amount of time and there's a lot of people who are very interested in this issue and so you want to make sure that you're having plenty of time for public comment and for hearings and things like that so you have to think that rulemaking will take 10 to 12 months at least from your date of enactment of any of your statutory changes and so what happens is you're going to have your medical program lagging behind your commercial program and so does it make sense, you know, like to have um, some of the things that are currently in this system once you have a kind of open system? And it goes to this issue that you brought up at the beginning where there may just be varying opinions on the policy of whether or not there's a, a true value to having a medical program when you have commercial stores available. And, um, and so the, the reason of trying to get everything up so that it will kind of merge at one point is so you can kind of take best practices and things that are, you know, that people would agree are best practices around consumer protection and testing and labeling and stuff around pesticides and inspections and things like that that don't exist in the current system. You're going to be folding those into the dispensaries, but things that maybe you don't want to hold dispensaries or patients to under the existing system, like you have to make an appointment, you can only go to one store, you know, or things like that. You, you know, if you, have, if you are so restrictive about that, but yet that same person can just walk into any store, any commercial store, then you might see people really fleeing the medical program. And, the, and again, I realize it may not be your position, but the position of the people who were working on this bill and passed it in the Senate so far has been that they value to have to continue to have a medical program, and they I don't want to. It. So, <laughs> um, so that's why you kind of have to do it all in in concert, and and that hopefully there's going to be a tremendous amount of overlap. So if you you know that that there shouldn't necessarily if if something is from a public health standard, you want you know to be advising, you know, whether it's a patient or someone else, you want to you know a lot of that's going to be very very similar. Um, and that there's only going to be a, you know, a few different areas where there's going to be differences between a, um, between a dispensary and, uh, and a, why is your code so hard to remember? Is it somebody's, no, it's not somebody's, but, um, <laughs> I know, I was going to say, <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, so, um, <laughs> you know, so there are these, uh, you know, up in the, I'm just going to draw your attention back to, to the intent section on dispensaries, you know, it lists the things that dispensaries can do that commercial can't, so they can be vertically integrated, um, uh, products aren't taxed, they can deliver, um, they can allow patients to purchase products without leaving their vehicles, they can produce and sell products that have a higher THC content that may be permitted under the commercial. So there's potency limitations 
in the commercial system that may not, but then when it comes to a medical product that may be appropriate for certain circumstances for, a med for somebody on the registry, but not for the commercial system. They also um, uh, could could sell larger quantities. So there's so there's a you know there's a a, a, a subset you know of advantages if you're a patient to being able to go to a particular store. Um, those may not be for you reason enough to to maintain a medical system. Well, can I ask the question? Yeah. Um, the topper had one first, I think, Carl, okay. and then Sandy. Um, I might go right now. Uh, mm -hmm. When the dispensaries start selling un under the commercial side, they start before any licenses, any new licenses are given. Correct. You mean doing early sales? Yeah. That's being still being discussed across the hall. There's that's not definite. Well, that's not definite. Okay. I, I was just wondering what kind of rules are they going to be operating on? The proposal, if they decide to go with that, is they would be a, be following the existing DPS rules with some exceptions. So the exceptions around plant counts and and location and things like that. Yeah. Carl. That was pretty much my question. It seemed like, if, you know, we were talking about eliminating the medical program, but the medical program is part of the apparatus for the early sales of the product under the way this, I understand. It. This okay. bill does not contemplate eliminating the medical. I'm sorry. This bill does not contemplate eliminating the medical. Yeah. No, I understand that, but okay. we talked about the possibility. I, I, but uh, the, the way I understand it, the mechanism under which the dispensaries can sell prior to the issuing of other licenses is through the current medical or the modified medical plan we have here, medical marijuana. Um, is that true or not? If, if there were early sales, yes, it would if be there through. Were early yeah. sales. Yep. It sounds like that's not um, Sandy. And then at some point, if possible, I would love to give Shayla the opportunity to share don't you were prepared to do to share the recommendations of the governor's marijuana policy things so that because that's so so my question has to do with with that interim period um, so we don't have right now there the, the, there's no there's no testing for mold okay and and, the, and presumably the board is going to say, "Thou shalt test for mold." But when will that when will that take effect on the dispensaries that are operating under Title 18? Is it going to be some kind of interim thing that 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 has an overlay of new regulation on top of what DPS is already doing in that interim period? No. So the way that the t the time the bigger timeline works, and I don't I don't know if you guys have the um, we do we do unless it's changed. It, it's always changing. <laughs> um, right. But so um, on there, as you look at so on or before. December 1st, 2020, we're going to see adoption of final rules, right? And so and they'll probably be like, these rules shall take effect. And those medical rules are going to take effect um, January 1st, 2021, when the new statutes come in with the program shift over and all of that stuff. And so they're going to have a heads up because they're going to be, I would assume, you know, participating in the comment and process. The DPS is going to be working with the board. On, you know, the, I'm sure the board is going to be looking at the existing DPS rules. Um, they're not going to reinvent the wheel. They don't have to. They're going to look at a lot of what's been working and what they want to import over. Um, and so what will happen is on that January 1st, 2021, is the program shift over. They operate under the new statutory guidance. They operate under the new rules. And they operate under the board. And so they wouldn't be required to go doing all of the new testing stuff until that time, because you have to have you have to give everybody plenty of time for the adoption of the rules. Does that answer your question? Yes. My question is more for you, Madam Chair, which is 
So the, this does not, I wasn't on the committee previous, and I'm curious how much, how long it took to really consider doing the medical program itself. 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's 14 years. years. Testimony, 14 years so ago. I mean, it's had, it's had, what's, iterations. Five or six iterations of, of talking to people and mm -hmm. so forth. Because this really is sort of the layering on of many new things. So mm -hmm. it's concerning <coughs> that it took us this long to get to a program that makes a lot of sense for the people who have real needs and that we're going to try and move this very quickly now. Don't worry, but just okay. I just put it out there. Okay. okay. I mean, these are all things of our discussions, and what will end up being our recommendations, both in terms of uh, um, <coughs> specific language and then general concepts. Um, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Sheila. I know. Have you missed me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just learned a lot. <laughs> I didn't know what it so Shale Livingston from the Health Department. So I'm here to talk about the um, recommendations that came out of the Summer Governor's Marijuana Commission Prevention and Education Report. Um, we, the commissioner was the chair of the, the committee, whatever you want to call it, um, that looked at prevention and education. And uh, they, they actually broke up into subgroups and then came back together. So it was, it was a whole process and um, your illustrious chair was also a participant. Hold on, Lita, I forgot something. It sounds like it's Sorry, important. I just wanted to let you know because I didn't talk about it because it wasn't in 54 that came over from the Senate, but it is in the government operations amendment and is very key to probably what you're discussing, which is that um, of the, uh, the retail excise tax, which is set at 16% currently in 54 in the government operations amendment, 30% of that revenue is dedicated to a new prevention, a substance misuse prevention fund. Good. So, um, <laughs> with, a, with a $6 million cap, annual cap. Very is exciting. There, there, we might like that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, that is very exciting. And I'll talk about that $6 million figure shortly. So um, pr previous to that, in 2016, the health department did what's called a health impact assessment, which is a process where you bring a lot of different stakeholders together and look at a policy that's being proposed and think about how, if that policy were to be enacted, how could you make it uh, have a better health impact or, or less bad health impact depending on the policy. Um, so we leaned, we also leaned on those findings um, in, in putting this together. Uh, so just, I'll give you a very brief overview of some of the things that I think apply to S54 and I will talk about the, the number that Michelle just, just quoted which is the, the six million dollar number and what that, what the health department could hope to do with that funding. So one of the things that I think is really important is that we have two legal substances, tobacco and um, alcohol, and we, we learned a lot. We have learned a lot over the years about them. Um, 
and what works and what doesn't work in terms of prevention. And some of the really, really important things are smoke-free policies, limiting access, which I know this committee has heard a lot about, and there's all sorts of different ways to limit out access in terms of limiting outlet density, um, the type of outlet, so making sure that you're limiting who who is going into these outlets, that it's not you know, a bakery that sells you know, regular cookies and brownies and also sells THC, so you've got a kid going in there that might have easier access, for example. Um, limiting the times that things can be sold and then limiting the age, obviously, um, that, that items can be sold. Um, also something this committee looked at is the increasing of taxes uh, in order to establish minimum prices. So pricing is a really important tool and, and children and young people are particularly sensitive to price. <coughs> Allowing for local control, so this is a, an option to, and to ensure that local municipalities can control all of the things I just mentioned. So not just whether or not there's a licensee, but what types, um, where they are, how they control who goes in, all of those things. Um, packaging and child resistant packaging is a very important thing to consider. Um, and making sure that kids, I mean, this is a problem that's been very serious in Colorado, is the young children taking too much of an edible and ending up in the emergency room. Um, Colorado have child resistant packaging. Oh boy, I think they do now. <laughs> you know the answer to that, Michelle? I can look, I would assume they do. I think they do and now. 54 requires that through the whole system. Limiting um, of advertising, so the, the question of, for example, point of sale, one thing that I talked about when we we're talking about the campaigns that the health department's working on is this point of sale advertising. So if you're a kid right now and you walk into a store, corner store, you might be bombarded by tobacco advertising, right? There might be cigarette ads all over the place. Um, so there's all different types of advertising, as we know, and, and youth exposure to that as we've seen with Juul, can be really, really important and impactful. And so having meaningful restrictions on advertising is a very important prevention strategy. And enforcing the laws. They don't do any good unless we have the personnel and the funding and the capacity to make sure that they are followed. So that's a very important piece. So that's, yep, oh, sorry. Um, Sheila, so um, this may or may not be a fair question, so feel free to Decline. To what extent um, do you believe that the bill that we have before us meets those eight areas? So I would have to do, I can, I'm willing and happy to come back and answer that. I would have to like really scrub it. I would expect the, that in some fashion or another they're, they are addressed, they're attempted to address, but to, to what extent where you think that maybe there might be things like the one that pops out to me is advertising. Yeah. I don't That's know if the latest sure. version is, but the advertising yep. that came yep. up from the Senate was really problematic. Yeah. <laughs> so I can try to do that analysis for okay. the committee. Uh, in, in fairness, do we want her to spend days and days on the Senate bill, or do we want her to wait until there's a draft of problems? Well, if, if, um, I mean, um, if GovOps has language, we're not, um, in terms of, I believe that there is, um, if GovOps has six votes to vote it out. I believe there is an interest in continuing this to move. And so to wait for GovOps to finish it, for it then to go to um, Ways and Means to the, I mean, you know, what, whatever your latest draft is, and we may have influence. You know, rather than asking Shayla to write it. <laughs> no, no, I just, I just was, I was just suggesting that she work on whatever is the latest. Whatever is the latest. Yeah, yeah. 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 look at the latest. Yeah. yeah. It's on the web page. Yeah. yeah. You can find it. Don't worry, I only have stuff to do in this committee tomorrow, so I'll have plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the funding. So what did the, this council recommended um, various different places to, to invest money in order to really invest in a comprehensive prevention strategy um, for marijuana. The so six, six is good, but seven would be better. <laughs> <laughs> Just the so. <laughs> uh, 
we get the six million dollar figure from the marijuana commission, the governor's yeah. marijuana. Okay, I'll, I'll get there. Which did have a report from the Department of Health, and that was the number that was okay. utilized in that report. I'll get there one second. So, um, so one of the things that was conceived was this idea of establishing a council and a fund, and that we would have to be able to manage that, and. Um, the amendment that is on that House GovOps is considering now would have, have this fund, a special fund, and the Bill 146 that you are contemplating has a council already. So we would not want to duplicate either of those efforts. So I'm going to skip those two recommendations. Um, this, for those who are interested, this report has an explanation of what comprehensive community-based prevention looks like. I know the committee's heard about the Iceland model and the Finland model, the Chile model. Um, but we kind of go through that and, and, and attempt to give examples, so it's a good place to go if you're looking for, for those examples. Oh, is, you got a so just even on this one and above, there's no mention of older Vermonters, and maybe there should be some prevention put into um, their older Vermonters' use of cannabis and also um, interactions with other medications that we mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, I just got an email from someone who attended your morning <laughs> about that, yeah. So, so it's, a good, it's a good point and I think one of the things that's really important about this model of regional prevention network, so that's the, the six million dollar number, mm -hmm. is establishing these regional prevention networks and the concept behind those is that they would do an assessment, a needs assessment of their region and be able to be flexible enough to determine, so right. let's say it's a region that doesn't have a whole ton of young people and they are having a very big problem with falls related to mixing substances, um, that that could be a strategy that they decide to implement. It would be good to see it in there because otherwise it might get overlooked. This is done. We're this really report is done. But. Um, However, I'm not sure how we would do that, but <laughs> yes, I think that that's, but that's sort of the, the reason that we want to, the reason that, we, that the department is interested in this type of model is to allow communities to respond to the problems that are facing them specifically and not prescribe, okay, state of Vermont, everybody's going to do this same thing, because that doesn't work as well. Um, Although some consistency is not a bad thing. So evidence-based strategies and evidence-informed strategies are very important. And so what we've done in the past, where we've done the regional prevention um, framework system, is provide, like, um, I think they call it a menu, um, and also allow for them to um, request a specific um, program or type so that it would still have to be approved, but it, but that if it's not on the menu, it doesn't mean that they couldn't, you know, do it as long as it was shown that it was really an effective thing. Strategy. No, now he's gonna just give me bunny ears. I just want to be able to see the screen. <laughs> um, so that so when we looked so when we went to testify when the, the commission went to testify for House GovOps, the total number for all of the different strategies. So this is just the community-based strategy that this prevention council recommended. Um, there it goes on to recommend. Um, funding for school-based prevention to the tune of 15 million. Um, and given the joint fiscal estimates for what the revenue is going to be in the tax and regulate system, when the programs and the department was asked to prioritize among these, this, actual, this group had prioritized that community regional network as the top most important thing if we had to choose. Um, and so that is where that recommendation came from, and that number. 
if we had everything we wanted in the whole wide world, we would also have school-based prevention and fund it fully, um, and fund it outside of the um, per student caps. The idea here would be to ensure that every single school has sufficient number of student you know, counselors who could actually work with students on the ground to do real prevention, intervention, treatment, and referral um, work. Do you know if there's any data on, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Is there any uh, data from AOE on the, like we know that there's like, a, well, less than two, like a dozen and a half schools that have the substance counselors. Is there any data in terms of those that have and those that don't have them? Let me look into that. I, we give grants to schools to do, and I don't know, some of them I think can use it for that, so let me. Yeah. Let me try to find out. I don't have that off the top of my head. The other thing is some nonprofits fund them in schools, so it there it's not there's not one kind of way that they're placed there. Mm -hmm. You know, like I know Spectrum funds several in the Burlington schools. So, at any rate, yeah. I let me see what I can find out. I don't know. Just trying to figure out. You know, we're, we're going to have you know X amount of resources, whatever those turn out to be. And, um, think that we want to make recommendations about where it's going to be the most effective place to put those resources. And, and I, I understand what your, your recommendation is, is those community-based um, regional networks. And I see that they would work in schools as well. I was going to say, so they could choose that. So they could say, look, this is the whole. The whole is, you know, having more counseling, more services for students in schools, um, and, and use that funding through that model. Um, but yeah, so so again, if the world, if we could have everything we want in the world, we would we would also be looking for about 15 million to fully fund that school system. The last thing is um, funding research on health effects. So this is one million dollars for a, a cohort study. You heard me talk a little bit about the PACE study um, a couple days ago. That's going to look at policy and education campaign effectiveness. So that's a cohort study because we're trying to follow kids over time. The concept here is that the, one of the things that we hear over and over and over again is there's not enough research on the impact of marijuana on, on health, period, especially current THC levels. And so the, the commission's idea here was that it, it's hard to get the federal funding to do that kind of work. And we could do a cohort study um, with a, probably with some university or college in Vermont um, to tr to track students or young people over time and actually measure those health effects in a way that was effective and, and real. And that would cost about a million bucks a year if we were going to maintain that. So that's where the five went to six. What was that? That's, is that where the five went to six? Because uh, that's in addition to. I mean, if your first priority was of, of this was. I cost six million. Oh, that was six million. Yeah. Sorry. I thought that was five. Yes. Never mind. Does that provide for anything? That six million does that provide for anything at the health department? Any personnel at the health department to work with these prevention groups? Um, so no, that's why it was seven. The to that's why this big. Um, this big number up here was seven million because there was additional pieces, evaluation, and other pieces that we had wanted to include in that, including staff time. Um, we'll live with it. Given I would love more, but we'll live with it. I mean, given the salary level of the members of the board that's being proposed, of, of the candidates' mm -hmm. board. If there's only a certain amount of money that can go around, perhaps those salary levels can be adjusted to put some more money into staffing, um, even if it's whatever the person in the health department from the other bill. So um, one of our, I mean, just so the committee knows what my business office tells me to say is one FTE costs about $100,000 on average. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 
I can report that my front porch form has been mad for abuse volunteers. Yes. So did mine. Great. Has everybody heard the Do Your Part campaign on VPR? I, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are other questions for Shannon right now. And just so, just so I know my homework. <laughs> the, the, homework is, is to look at the, the committee would like this list and a chart, right? What's what's recommended here and what's in S fifty four? How it lines up? Well, maybe just to look at what is in S fifty four. Fifty four. Around, you know, around these priorities, around that, and around advertising, Got it. in particular. Advertising, because that, I mean, that's the language we've seen. Okay. Okay. Advertising okay. seems to be the big one. But mm -hmm. <coughs> to figure out that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, committee, I don't know if, if we want to talk more about this. That we did talk yesterday about leaving at a particular time to do committee. Oh. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Wall, and I'm the, and I'm the director, excuse me, <clears throat> of the Vermont Crime Information Center with the Vermont Department of Public Safety, and we're the entity that currently oversees the dispensary program uh, in Vermont. As always, I'd like to primarily spend my time today answering any questions that the committee may have. I do have a few things that have been passed along to me as notes and some questions that may have come up, so let me provide a few answers that might be helpful right up front, and then I'll answer any questions that I can. Um, a question came up regarding patient numbers and how that potentially may have changed. Um, our high of patient numbers, and the number literally changes moment to moment because we're always adding and folks are, 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 are uh, not renewing their license, so it's even one day to the next, it changes. But as of June of 2018, we had a high of approximately 5,700 patients registered with the dispensary. Uh, as of December 18, it was down to 5,300 patients with the registry. And as of today, when I checked with registry staff, we were at, at approximately 5,200. So that, that, that is different than the number that uh, a member of government operations told me the other night they thought there were only about 700. Oh, what? Really? Mm -hmm. They got that? Mm -hmm. Just, uh, Not even sure what that number could come from, but. Uh, um, me not, me either. The, the, those represent the current number of patients uh, that we have um, on the registry. 52. Curr currently 5,200 approximately, yes, yes. Um, and since the, the um, law was passed last year, um, we have seen a steady but not substantial decrease. It hasn't fallen off uh, per se, but it has been, the number has been moving down. We don't have any way to project this time next year what the number may look like. There's just uh, no ability uh, to do that, but it has been uh, decreasing slightly. I understand there was also potentially a question around background checks for financiers um, and what information they have to di disclose to the department. Uh, they are required to do a fingerprint supported record check the same way a dispensary employee or principal would, would be, but we don't have any additional oversight of financiers. Having said that, I am not sure what regulations might exist if someone wants to come in and invest a large amount of money into Vermont, what disclosures with tax or someone else they might have to make. But as far as our, the Department of Public Safety is concerned, we don't have any additional oversight or inquiry into where the money is coming from, for example. That's not within our, our wheelhouse, so to speak. <clears throat> On there, uh, there was a question about the, uh, the, or perhaps a comment about the length of time for the fingerprint supported record checks to be completed. From when we receive everything we need to receive, it's typically two to three weeks. However, sometimes folks may have to wait several weeks to get in to have their fingerprints taken to even begin the process. So, someone looking outside might think, well, if it takes DPS two to three weeks and it takes me three weeks to get in, that's a six-week process where our processing time may only be two to three weeks, but from the outside, it looks like it's a six or week or longer process. Do you do fingerprints for school teachers? Uh, we process them. We don't take them. Uh, they, they have to go through the same and process as anyone else. 
the same amount of time, the same amount of time. So they all, they all go through the same. The only group that we provide any priority to is individuals applying for um, emergency uh, child care or foster care placement. We do those typically within 24 hours of receipt. Everything else goes in the hopper and we process it um, as soon as we can. We have a pretty good operation, but it does take two to three weeks from when we receive everything to process it there. <clears throat> As far as the municipal opt-in or opt-out, what we currently require for dispensaries as part of the application process or any update is a letter from the town they are proposing that simply um, indicates that the town does not have any prohibition against the dispensary opening up or any type of uh, uh, um, entity opening up in that location. Um, and that's primarily to be candid with the committee so that no one at the town can come to us and go, well, why didn't anyone tell us about this? We didn't know about this. And so it's, it's to make sure everyone is informed um, on that. We do not track um, towns that have a prohibition. I do know they're just uh, in discussion. There are, I believe, a small number of towns or municipalities that may have prohibited through local ordinances. We don't actually track that. We require the dispensary to provide us with, with proactive proof that there's nothing pro uh, prohibiting them. Um, from opening. Uh, we typically get a letter from the uh, either select board or if the town has a mayor or town office, uh, town manager just stating that they've been approached by ABC and that there's nothing that prohibits that entity from opening or operating within the town. So, and we keep that on file again um, so that we're doing our due diligence. <clears throat> due diligence there. So, those are, those are a few questions that, that I understand folks may have had. Just as a follow up to that, so mm -hmm. if the town were to write that and say, um, no, we would not like the entity to open a, a medical dispensary, well, is that within their right? Then would you just not do it? Or how does that happen? Well, if we received something back saying they were prohibited, right. um, then we wouldn't proceed with the, the with the application, or we would communicate that back. We typically require the dispensaries to provide those to us, so I doubt we would even see it. They would simply say, "Well, we're going to change where we're going because the town won't provide us or won't allow us to operate." Um, I, I suppose we could get a letter, but I have a binary concept. Um. You were talking about background checks for financiers and that you do a fingerprint um, check on that. So if, if uh, you know, financier came back with, uh, you know, something on that person's record, um, would that be a reason for you to deny a permit or deny a license? Uh, well, it, it would, if it came back, um, there is a metric in the current statute in the rule that talks about, depending on the nature of the offense, how long ago it was, has there been any criminality since then, um, either it's denied um, or it's preceded. Uh, if someone had a misdemeanor simple assault 25 years ago and they haven't had anything since then, it's unlikely to hang, hang up. If it's something more recent, um, then it may be denied, but they can appeal that. Uh, they can appeal that either on two grounds, either the accuracy, which anyone having a criminal history background check done may always appeal the accuracy of that, um, whether it be for education or license, anything. They can appeal the accuracy of that, and we'll review that on the accuracy grounds. Or that they've been rehabilitated, um, so that if they had a misdemeanor marijuana you know, 11 years ago, that's a drug offense. It would, it would be a, a typical preclusion. However, they can come back and appeal, and we would review that internally, um, determine whether or not we felt like they had been rehabilitated, um, and then move forward. As, as far as to whether or not it would, it, that would specifically uh, speak to someone's individual card or their ability to interact with, um, but it wouldn't necessarily hold up the, uh, a license application, but they may have to find funding from other sources. And then, um, so from from your perspective on a slightly different topic, if um, if legislation passes and the transition date is set as January of 2021, does that seem like a sufficient amount of time to transition from public safety to the Cannabis Control Board? That's a good that's that's a good question. Um, I would honestly have to defer that primarily to, to individuals that would be involved with the Cannabis Control Board, whoever would be setting or overseeing that up, because they would have to be the ones to get their infrastructure up to speed for us to hand off the program. The program runs fairly well right now. Um, so handing it off to someone else, from my perspective, okay, here's a, here's a highly functioning program, we're handing this off to someone else. Um, 
whether or not they're prepared to receive it or not would, would depend on how well their, their rules and, and, and are vetted and, and are set up. I can speak from having been involved in rulemaking for this and also a couple of other programs we have at VCIC. Um, it can be a challenging process um, to go through and work through, but with dedicated resources, it's certainly very doable to get through in a, in a 10 to 12 month process to well-crafted um, rules that can be useful and implement, implementable. So from my perspective, we're happy to hand it off uh, whenever we're required to by statute. We're happy to hold on to it as long to as well. Um, but it would really be up to the person receiving it as opposed to from my perspective. So, so, so let, me, let me just repeat what you just said. What I have heard reported is DPS is fine, wants to get rid of it. What I hear you saying is if you hand it off, it's fine, and if it stays with us, it's fine. From my perspective, um, we implement the program based on the statute. So if the statute requires it to stay in DPS, we'll keep administering it. If the statute indicates it needs to move, then that's fine too. If there's a policy decision as to whether it should or shouldn't, I would have to defer to somebody else to speak to that policy. But from my perspective as the administrator. So who, who would you be deferring to? To Deputy Commissioner Herrick or Commissioner Anderson. Yeah. So. And remind us, your staff, how many people so currently we have three full-time staff and one part-time staff uh, temporary employee. Are you full-time? Are you one of the... No, ma'am. No, what, you're no. The, Are you the part-time? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I am not... Uh, none of the above. Uh, okay. None of the above. No, no. <laughs> this uh, the position existed before... The, this, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my distribution of time varies wildly depending on, to be candid, partly what the legislature is curious about. So uh, I spend more time dealing with it than, than other times. Uh, but no, as director, I, my time gets divvied up under a number of things, and, and I spend whatever time is required on any particular area. So, so... Um, I know that this was originally set up to be uh, supposed to be self-sufficient in terms of um, funding the administration of the program. Is that proven to be true? It has been, yes, ma'am. It has been. Uh, no other VCIC operations are funded by this uh, program, um, and we do not divert any funds from any other any other funds within VCIC <coughs> to fund the program. I believe the legislature did, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I realize you did not. You take no, but I believe that the legislature did. There, there was a surplus of funds that, that um, were generated partly through one-time monies. Um, they came in through application fees, et cetera, and we had also had been and continued to be operating under a, the charitable term I'll use is antiquated database to, to maintain this this program. Um, knowing that's expensive, IT projects are expensive, we were banking that money. Some of that did get uh, uh, um, taken away uh, uh, from that. So reappropriate. Thank you. Much better term than taken away. Thank you. Reappropriated. Um, and, I, and I can't speak to where that ultimately, uh, ultimately went, but uh, we continue to move forward with the necessary projects on that. But we have always taken, um, I've been in my role for nine years approximately. So um, I haven't been here for the entire length of any type of marijuana registry, but I've seen certainly since the dispensaries seen the program change. And we've always taken it very seriously that this is meant to be a self-funded, self-sustaining program um, and tried to view it as such. <clears throat> is this um, something for Commissioner Anderson? Okay. Um, in terms of their thoughts as to the changes that are being proposed. Um, you've just described mm -hmm. this as a well-functioning. Correct. Maybe I'll take a step back. What does well-functioning mean? What do you mean by that? From my perspective, we meet our targets. Uh, there are certain targets as far as processing times, et cetera. We meet those targets. We have to process app complete application within 30 days. We meet those. We meet those targets. Um, we have dispensaries. We have all of our dispensary licenses are currently being used. None of them are sitting fallow or vacant. Um, they're all up and running. Um, we do have, while we have, we've had a slight decrease in the number of patients uh, since the middle of last year. We're still over 5,000, which if you look at the historical trend, it's the rate has climbed substantially every year with a slight dip this year. Um, and I think we can say due to partly due to changes that happened last year in law around, around marijuana and cannabis. Um, as far as that goes. 
we tend to take our, our requirement to provide necessary oversight as required by statute, but not micromanage the dispensaries. Um, there's a lot of information they're required to provide to us. There's a lot of statutory requirements on their operations, and we, we hold them to that, but we don't get involved in the day-to-day -day business operations um, of the dispensaries to let them operate. Um, and we serve Vermonters. Uh, we, we talk to them every day. We talk to Vermont residents every day who are applying for the program, answer questions um, on that, and process their applications and get their cards back to them uh, in a timely manner. So, from my perspective, I would consider that a well, a well functioning program. <clears throat> I believe you were here in the beginning of the session, and uh, there was a woman who was one of the members of the mm. marijuana, right. whatever. Oversight committee, Oversight yes. Oversight committee, yes. and it's a little unclear whether she was talking to the commission or herself, but mm. um, she raised the issue of um, designating a, and other um, cardholders have raised the issue of having to designate uh, a dispenser. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, I, um, What about if we remove that requirement? From my perspective, candidly, it would reduce one administrative hurdle. I mean, because we have to track that. And if an individual wants to change dispensary, we have to cancel their card, issue them a new card, mail it out. It's an administrative piece. Um, how it would affect the dispensaries, I would have to defer to representatives of the dispensaries to talk about how it would affect them. Um, I believe it was mentioned earlier in the discussion, part of the metric of how much product they could produce was tied to the number of patients they had. So you had to, by nature, have some sort of corollary between those two. Um, whether or not they could operate or function within a, a more um, open, for lack of a better word, um, market, so to speak, um, I would have to defer to them. But from my, just strictly from a, it's one less thing we'd have to track, one less detail we'd have to manage and would, would uh, uh, reduce the amount of administrative uh, processing we have to do for patients. <clears throat> um, some of the forms have been described as very prescriptive because they're in the legislation. If you had a magic wand, the language that is in the forms, what what language, what part of the existing forms right now are duplicative, overly detailed? not useful for managing the program or identifying patients? The, the forms that, that patients, health care providers, and caregivers have to complete have gone through a number of iterations through the years. Uh, partly that is due to the fact that when this first came on, for, and even from my perspective nine years ago, um, volume was much lower. So there was that issue. But also, the department didn't have a lot of expertise in managing citizen registration. It wasn't anything that we did. Um, so we had to learn a little bit by working with the patients. And then when the dispensaries came on, how to make things as, as easy as possible, given all the information we're required to collect and verify. Um, I, I, I tend to uh, note that a lot of individuals don't realize, particularly talking outside of, of for example, these halls, that we have to verify a fair amount of the information that's on the form. We just don't take it and go, okay, it all looks like it's good. We have to just call the healthcare provider back and go, is this accurate? Is this true? Did you sign this? Is this complete? Um, are they a patient of yours, for example? We're required to do that, that sort of work. Um, so given the amount of information we're required to receive and then verify, I think the forms are in pretty good shape. The one thing I would recommend were I to be able to do that is the requirement of having a cover page or cover letter. It, it just, just literally is a page with just writing and it has no input. The patients don't actually do anything. And some of the goals of having that could be accomplished through the design of the form itself, as opposed to having a page which is just literally torn off and put in the recycling. And there's no value added for us for that. And I would, I would, uh, Question and maybe there is an answer which is not a, which is not expected to this, but question: How many patients and caregivers and healthcare providers find it useful to have a cover page with all this information on it, rather than the form just being more self-guiding? Um, 
there. We literally we just recycle those pages when we get them back. There's just nothing on them um, that we need. So that would probably be the single thing. Well, I just mean, perhaps I asked the question in uh, backwards. Um, and this may be something you want to think about and come back with. Um, um, in terms of the information that we require <clears throat> mm -hmm. in statute for you to, how much of it is, from now that you have nine years of experience of running this program, mm -hmm. how much of it is like, why are we doing this? Um, to, yeah, it makes sense to um, actually verify that Dr. Pugh is a doctor or, you know, is seeing mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Representative Rumstead. Well, from my perspective, and, and I appreciate the, re, the rephrasing of the question, it does help. Um, the way the forms are constructed, it's really meant to ensure that a qualifying patient is qualified and their health care provider does meet the requirements. So if those were, the only way the forms could be streamlined or changed, if that's perhaps part of the question, would be if, if the requirements are streamlined or changed. Otherwise, we have to gather that level of detail um, in order to, uh, to move forward. So unless the requirements change, then the forms are going to have a certain amount of complexity regardless. Other questions for you? Did, did we talk, I, I may have missed this, but a um, number of um, individuals who are youth who are in the registry? I didn't pull that number this okay. morning. It is very low. Very low. Very low. Okay. Um, a handful, a solid handful. Uh, okay. You know, I'm sorry, what's the question? Number of youth people under oh, the age of 21. It, it's, very, it's very low. Uh, it's okay. very low. It's not, not any kind of substantial group okay. at all. It's, it's fairly low. Got it. There always are a couple, but it's fairly mm -hmm. low. Okay. Stop. Just want to make a statement. Okay. I want to thank you and your people the job that you've done and you continue to do. I think Vermont has, this is on my opinion, probably the best medical side of the marijuana piece in the whole country. And um, one of the things that I want to do is ensure that that stays that way. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that that uh, comment, and I will certainly pass that along to the staff. They do amazing work with, with the patients in the program, so I will make sure to pass that along. Thank you very much. Yes, please do that, and to the extent that you are able to. I will. A break, are able to. Um, given that, we are interested as the committee that has focused on um, this area. We are interested in your comments on the medical marijuana piece mm -hmm. uh, um, and some of the shifts and changes contemplated. I will happily pass that along. Um, realizing um, this, is why, this is why I'm being very honest, you may not be able to do that because this is from the point of view of if this, assuming this goes forward, Mm -hmm. Assuming the larger package goes goes through goes forward, mm -hmm. um, what makes sense for maintaining the integrity mm -hmm. of what you identified as one of the best mm -hmm. programs? I will absolutely pass that up. Thank you. And if they could get back to me by Tuesday as to whether or not they're <laughs> able to do this, I will pass it when I get back to the office this Thank afternoon. You. You're welcome. Other questions right now? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you very much.
many other places. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you very much for everybody. Um, we're having a um, come to Jesus moment <laughs> with the committee that is um, has nothing to do with this bill and has nothing to do with any other piece of legislation that is before us. And so we would like some private time.